you feed us from it. May you speak to us through your holy and righteous word. May we set aside any distractions that are uh, prevalent in our life and focus supremely on you for the next moments. God, we pray that as we study your word, we would worship you uh, through it and we would be changed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, as we were looking at Philippians at chapter 3, and this week as we continue on, I want to remind you of what Paul had been reminding the Philippian church. He told them last week in our uh, sermon that they are not justified by works. Our works are not what saves us. We are only justified through the perfect work of Christ on the cross. We can do nothing to achieve salvation. We cannot be good enough. We cannot give enough. We cannot serve enough. We cannot attend enough church. That is not where salvation lies. It only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing we've accomplished on this earth gains our salvation. It is the realization that we can do nothing and the acceptance of grace, the grace of God through the belief in Jesus that can save us. Though when we become saved, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean we become perfect. Yes, the work of grace is complete upon salvation, but the work of sanctification is not complete. Did you know that some people believe that once we become saved, we no longer sin and we are perfect we achieve immediately a sinless perfection. We no longer sin, but that is simply not biblical. It has no biblical basis. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here today. No Christian will attain the perfection of Christ in this life. It is only when we re-enter into heaven that we attain the perfection of Christ, when, when we are called to heaven and we receive our heavenly bodies. Now, sanctification is one of those big, fancy theological words that simply means that as a Christian who is saved, you are set apart, set apart from the world for the purposes of purification. We are set apart in order to be perfected. We are in the process now, for those of us who are in Christ, of being perfected, and we will be perfected when we reach the borders of heaven. When we are saved, yes, we are set apart. And yes, we are set apart in order that we might become more like Christ. You see, becoming like Christ and being perfected are one and the same. This is an ongoing process, and of course, it's not completed until we are with the Father in heaven. You remember from last week that Paul says, all that I have gained, all that I had earned on this earth, I count as nothing compared to the pursuit of following Jesus Christ. He desires that he may know him and the power of his resurrection and that he may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, he may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul knew very well that salvation was complete for those of us who are saved, but that becoming like Christ was a work that would continue and only be completed upon entering the afterlife, entering into heaven with God. Now, those same people who say, well, when we're saved, we become perfect, um, they would also uh, hazard to uh, beg the question, why should we then pursue spiritual growth since we are already promised spiritual inheritance that will not die and will not fade away? Why do we need to pursue the perfection that is Christ? Because it is true that once we become saved, we are saved we are set apart and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Nothing can change that. So why do we pursue? Well, you remember in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, he says, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According <clears throat> excuse me, to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power <clears throat> we are being guarded through our faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It is true that our salvation is signed, sealed, and delivered. All things are done and completed, right? Yes, we are saved. Yes, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. But if God has you alive, raise your hand if, you, if your heart is still beating, right? Everyone? Everyone? Well, this means that if you're a Christian and your heart is still beating on this earth, we still have things to accomplish for God. We still have a perfection that is not ours, but is yet to come. <clears throat> Why do we pursue spiritual growth then? Can we just sit back on our laurels and, and, and ride this out um, into eternity? Some people have chosen to do that. They've chosen to become hermits and separate themselves from the world and separate themselves from any spiritual growth. And yet that is not the answer. The answer of why we pursue perfection, the perfection of Christ, is that it glorifies God. It's that it proves we are his. It's that it testifies to the world the riches of his glories. Paul clarifies um, what might have been confused by the Judaizers. You see, Paul is addressing the Philippian church who've been misled by the Judaizers who, who say, you must be saved, yes, through Christ, but you must do all the other Jewish customs. You must, you must have grace plus works to be saved. Well, that's not true. Anything added to salvation, salvation plus works, salvation plus anything else is not salvation at all. And Paul is driving this home. He is clarifying what might have been confused by those Judaizers. They were, of course, saying faith plus work saved. And Paul says, no, that is not true. And in, in our text this morning, the, the, the few verses we're going to focus in, 12 through 16, he says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made it his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. For the purposes of this message this morning, I want us to take a look at Paul's actions within the sanctification process. Now remember, sanctification is being set apart for the purposes of purification. And purification, being perfect, is being like Christ. Now three things. First of all, Paul presses on to take hold of Christ. He presses on to take hold of perfection. Now, what he had just said in the previous verses might lead one to think that Paul thinks he's perfect. Look at me. Look how great I was. I gave it all up. Now I've taken on Christ. Look at me. Aren't I grand? But he says, no, I'm not saying that I have obtained this, but I am pressing on to attain this. Ever since Paul was saved by Christ, he desired to grasp and comprehend Christ, but to know the incomprehensible greatness of Christ demands our life, our lifetime. It is arduous. It is an arduous endeavor of inquiry that we pursue Christ. Paul's desire to gain Christ and to be found in him and to know Christ and to engage him in an intimate relationship is a fantastically dynamic process of understanding and comprehension and reaching out for the prize of Christ. Paul contrasts his previous statements of what he gave up by strongly denying that he has already become perfect, lest anyone bring that charge against him. Because he was not already fully, uh, he had not fully grasped the perfection of Christ. 
he has not already become perfect. Only when he sees Christ face to face will he totally be transformed by Christ's power to be like him. Paul anticipates that he will become perfect in a future sense, but only on the day of Christ and only by the power of Christ. And until then, he honestly admits his imperfection. Do you know that the world will look at Christianity and they will call us what? Hypocrites. They are right. We are. Because we are not perfect. And we never will be until we have our heavenly bodies and we are with Christ in heaven. We cannot attain perf perfection in a sin sick world. Yes, we will say we love Christ. And then we will prove that we still love the world a little bit too. We are hypocrites. We are. Embrace that. Don't deny it. But, but do pick up and do embrace the fact that one day we will be perfect like Christ. You know, in the early days of Christendom, the word Christian was a derogatory term. You little Christs. And now we take it on as a badge of honor that we, yes, we are Christians. And yet many of us are not endeavoring to be like Christ. Many of us who claim Christ have never once even read through the Gospels and don't know who Christ really is or what he did or what he said. Yes, we are Christians because we are trying and endeavoring by the power of the Holy Spirit to become like him. And one day, for those of us who are real Christians, that endeavor will be fulfilled when we go to heaven. He and we are trying to apprehend Christ, to, to grab on to Christ because he has grabbed on to us. Paul is completely aware that he is not and will not be perfect until eternity. He has not perfectly grabbed hold of Christ. He believes in Christ, but he is not fully like him. However, he continues to run. He continues to pursue the prize. And this is what he describes next in verse 13 and 14. So in verse 12, we see that he is pressing on to take hold of perfection, to take hold of Christ. And then in verse 13 and 14, Paul presses on toward the goal. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. He's singularly focused. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what, what does he mean by this? We, many of us who are Christians, we, we've heard these verses before, but what does he mean? Well, first of all, he admits that he isn't perfect, as we have noticed, and he hasn't received that perfection, that full reward, as we've mentioned, but he is racing toward it. He is running to what lies ahead in eternity. You see, the goal Paul mentions is the very pursuit of Christ's likeness in the here and now. So every Christian ought to be running for the goal that is Christ's likeness here and now. Though we won't achieve it, we should be pursuing it. How, how do we do that? By, by understanding and digesting the word of God and applying it to our lives, being around the brethren, listening to the word of God preached, praying all the things, allowing the fruit of the spirit to, be, to work in our life. The goal Paul mentions is the pursuit of Christ's likeness in the here and now. The prize is the reward of Christ's likeness in heaven. So he says, I press on toward being like Christ now. Why? Because I want to achieve the prize of being like Christ fully in heaven. That's what he's saying. That's what he's, he's proclaiming. That prize motivated Paul to run to win. Paul is not a stranger to use, using race metaphors, racing, running metaphors. He, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive with a perishable wreath but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, 
lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He is straining for the goal. Believers will not receive the prize, which is Christ's likeness, until we reach eternity or until we hear the upward call. Now, what is the upward call? Upward simply tells us from which and from or from where the call originates, from where the call emanates. God calls us from heaven to follow him. Salvation is a work of God through Christ alone. We don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. He calls and we respond. So yes, he calls us from heaven to be his child, but he also will call us to come and join him in heaven, whether by death or by uh, being caught up with him in the sky. God will and can call us and only calls those of us who are true children of God. One day God will usher all the saved into his glorious presence in heaven. Perfection is not attainable in this life. Christ, complete Christ likeness is not attainable in this life, but it is worth the effort to try and attain it while we are here on earth. The finish line, though, is the threshold of heaven uh, where the rewards will be handed out. If you remember in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, Apostle Paul says, Now if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved only through only as through fire. You see, we are, we are striving to work for God. We are striving to become more like Christ. We are striving to build up things that we can offer him, not things in our own flesh, but spiritual things. Now, let me make this very clear. Paul says, you cannot achieve salvation by works nor can you keep salvation by works. Let me be clear. This is not what Paul is saying, that we somehow keep our salvation by striving to become more like Christ. No, salvation, we are signed, sealed, delivered. But because of salvation, we are compelled to follow after Christ to become like him. Salvation is not simply a get-out-of-jail-free card. We are not saved to do then whatever we like. If one professes Christ and then lives like the world, never showing any fruitfulness of salvation, that person is not of Christ. Let me me say that again. If one professes Christ and never lives like him and always lives like the world, then there is no evidence that that person has been changed And one can only surmise that person is not of Christ. You see, repeating a sinner's prayer is not some magical incantation that magics you out of hell. Salvation is life change. It is new birth. It is born of heaven. And salvation will, underline that, will, will produce good works that flow from a child of God to God as, as worship and honor of him. We will produce good works, not for salvation, not to keep salvation, but as a product that reveals we are saved. Paul is clearly, extremely clear that works do not save us, as I said, but salvation does not produce, uh, salvation does produce good works and is a uh, uh, product of our life change. And it will also produce holiness, but our salvation is not kept by our good works. Our salvation is kept by the hands of God and through the sacrifice of Jesus. You see, this is what James is stating in James chapter 2, because he says, faith without works is dead. All of those who are truly saved 
are compelled to pursue holiness, to pursue Christ's likeness. And so the things of God, the, 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 the life change that happens in us will, will emanate, will pour from us, not in perfection, not in sinlessness, but it will be there. There will be evidence there. Thankfully, we cannot know for certain the spiritual state of a person, but we can see their fruit. We can see the life change that God has created in them. True children of God continue and will continue to become like Christ. But it is not until Christ appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Paul had spent all of his life pressing on to obtain perishable things, things that would be burned up, and then he gets saved and changed, and he then begins to press on taking hold of that which is imperishable. Thirdly, we don't have to do this alone. We don't press on by ourselves. In verse 15 and 16, this is what Paul is alluding to. He said, basically, while we press on toward the goal, the perfection of Christ, we thankfully strive together. We do not race on our own. Do you know when we watched the Olympics in the last over the summer, if you would see an athlete, maybe they were doing an individual sport. But I can promise you they were not doing it alone. They might be running the race by themselves in that lane, but they had coaches, they had family, they had people who supported them, who loved them, who cared for them, who might even have prayed for them. If they won the gold medal, they were looking in the crowd or, or, or looking for the, the screen this time around to, to see that live stream of their family who had been watching. They didn't do it alone. Neither do we. We work and strive together. That's why God created the church. That's why he has created this, this um, beautiful um, family of faith for us to strive together. We should all think as Paul did and not become complacent or refuse to grow in our faith. And like Paul, believers must totally be focused on making the maximum effort to pursue the prize of Christ likeness. For we know how Christ thinks because scripture gives us his mind. Remember 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him that we have the mind of Christ? When we think biblically, when we think about divine things, Viewing all life from the Lord's perspective, those thoughts will move our behavior to become more like his. Remember what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3? He is talking about striving together as the body of Christ. And he says in Colossians 3, 16 and 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our pursuit of the prize, which is the perfection of Christ, is one that we do together. We study the Bible together. We worship God together. Yes, because it is what he is due but we do it together also for the mutual encouragement that we receive. We disciple one another. We discipline one another. We pray together. We eat together. We proclaim the word of God together. We fellowship together. We stand on the front lines to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world together. And we pursue holiness together because we are not lone rangers. We are not meant to be on our own. We are not meant to be cloistered away on a mountaintop away from everyone else. We are meant to be together, helping each other, holding each other accountable when our life does not reflect the holiness of Christ and moving together. We text each other. We pray for each other. We encourage each other to, to keep the faith, to keep following after Christ, that when the world hurts us, 
We, we come together and we build each other up. Why? Why do we do that? Because our pursuit of the prize, because we want to become more like Christ, less like the world and more like Jesus Christ. If we call ourselves Christians, then that ought to be our pursuit. And isn't it wonderful that we don't do it alone? Your struggles are my struggles. Your hurts are my hurts. Your joys are my joys. We do this together. It shouldn't be a week that we go through that we not, we're not at church. We're not texting each other. We're not calling each other. We're not going for a walk together. We're not having a meal together because we need each other. Because we're not yet perfect. We're not yet fully like Christ. A couple of closing thoughts. Do you realize that you're in a race? Do you realize that? Wake up. You are in a race. And we are to be pursuing Christ's likeness every day. Are you actively pursuing holiness? Or are the things of God merely an afterthought? Oh, yeah. It's already Friday, and I haven't even thought about God once. Are you striving for the things that do not matter eternally? Or are you striving for the things that do? I just would call you Christians. Remember, you're in a race. We're not perfect. We're not sinless. But we're striving to become like the one who is. And for those of you who may be listening this morning on Zoom or here in the church that you say, you know, I don't know that I have a relationship with God. I don't even know that I'm, that I'm on the track, on the right track. My prayer is that you trust Christ today, that you join the race and begin pursuing the only thing that truly matters, which is the, the perfection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm keenly aware as we study your word in these moments that we cannot even begin to scratch, to begin to plumb the depths of your, your word. We merely just scratch the surface and Lord, there, there may be other questions that come and I just pray that you'd, you'd help us uh, uh, to find answers, motivate us if they need to speak to me or another elder or someone else in the church and follow up with conversation. I pray that they would do that today. I pray if there's someone here this morning that has questions about their relationship with, with, Christ, with God through Christ, whether they have one or not, that they would be bold and come and speak with me or someone else right, close by. Lord, so often we, we fail you, and so often we don't do what's right. Uh, but Lord, today I pray that we'd be resolved to, to wake up, to stretch and to prepare to run the race today. There's still time to be focused on you, to pursue you, to press on toward the goal and to reach out for the prize. Lord, we don't have to think very hard to know that we are, even though we might be saved, we are not perfect. God, help us, help us in our pursuit to be more like you. May people be able to look at us and say, there goes a Christian. There goes that Christian. There goes that, that weirdo, that, that crazy person who goes to the church. I don't know why they do that. Or may that be named among us because we are living so faithfully to you that, that, uh, that, our, Christ, that our, our pursuit of Christ's likeness flows from us, emanates from us. And then may you receive all the honor and glory and praise for it. God, may it not be a shock for our friends and family and coworkers to know that we're a child of God. May it not be something that they don't realize about us. God, help us to be people in, in, in prayer on our knees, uh, before you in your, in your word, studying to show ourselves approved. God, help us. We have such a great task to accomplish in, in our neighborhood, in, in this area. But our, our first our first desire our first pursuit has to be the perfection of christ lord help us to become more and more like christ we long for the day that we will be with you in heaven and that 
sin will no longer plague us and we will be able to achieve the perfection found in Christ. But until that day, Lord, encourage us, challenge us to be all that we can be for you. God, we love you and we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you're in complete control and that in spite of knowing exactly who we are, you love us all the same. Those, especially for those of us who are your children, you have a, a greater and more special love and attention for us. God, may we in our lives reflect that great love by the way that we live, the way that we strive forward toward the prize. In Jesus' name, amen.